Welcome to my course on databases. Today I will give a brief introduction. Let's start with the goals and the structure of the course. Maybe let's start with the question why you should follow this course. The motivation for databases is that storing data is important everywhere across industry. Databases are ubiquitous in computer science. The overall goal of this course is to get a thorough understanding of database concepts. Here we are looking at databases from a user perspective. We are not looking how databases work internally. The learning goals in particular are developing data models using entity relationship diagrams, reasoning about good or bad design of databases using functional dependencies, querying databases using non-trivial SQL statements, and to obtain a tiny bit of knowledge of database programming. The structure of this course is as follows. First, we'll start with an introduction and overview. That's what you're currently listening to. Then we will look at data modeling. Our main tool there will be entity relationship diagrams. Next, we will translate these conceptual models into the relational model. We will design the structure of our database. Once we've designed this structure, we will start querying the database using SQL. Next, we will look at functional dependencies and how to reason about good and bad database design. And finally, we will look at transactions and a little bit of database APIs. Let's have a look at database management systems. A database is a collection of data with a certain logical structure and specific semantics. A database management system allows us to manage databases. It allows to create, modify, and manipulate a database. It allows to query the data in a database using a specific query language. It supports the persistent storage of large amount of data, and it does this in a way that guarantees durability and recovery from failure. So if the system where the database runs on crashes, the database should be able to recover to the last consistent state. The database management system also provides an access control such that many users can work in parallel, and it does so in a way that excludes unexpected interactions between the users. This is called isolation, and it also does so in a way that even if the system crashes or something happens, that the actions of the users are always done either fully or not at all. This is called atomicity. So why should we use database management systems instead of just storing data in files? First of all, with files we don't have a nice query language. And the reason is that the file system provides a very weak logical structure. We basically only have directories to structure our data. With files we also don't have an efficient way of data access. Databases can be terabytes large. If you have a file that is terabytes large, searching through this file can take hours. Finally, file systems provide only limited protection from data loss, and they don't have an access control that enables many users to access and manipulate the files in parallel. So we really need database management systems for these kinds of tasks. Most database management systems follow the so-called ANSI Spark architecture. The motivation behind this structure is as follows. Databases are extremely complex programs. They are built to achieve the outermost efficiency for data access. They build indices over the data structures, they optimize the layout of the data on the disk and in the RAM, and so on. But the user does not want to know about all these implementation optimizations. The user should interact with a simple logical view on the data and this view should be independent of the internal optimizations and the physical storage. So the user interacts with this simple view and we will see in the relational model that we are considering the simple view are just tables. And behind the scenes 
are all the complex optimizations, the storage structures for rapid access, and so on. Another motivation for these views is the avoidance of duplication. Different users can have different views, maybe because they have different rights, they are not allowed to see certain things, so we can hide things in these views. Also, we can have different views for different applications. So we want to have these views, but the data behind should only be stored once. We don't want to duplicate the storage of the data on the disk. This is achieved by the ANSI Spark architecture. The ANSI Spark architecture defines three levels. At the bottom, we have the physical or internal level. This is where the data is stored on the disks. Then we have the logical level, also called conceptual level. This is a simplified view on the physical data. And then we have our external or view level. This is the different views of the users or applications on the logical level. And by using these different views, we avoid that data at the physical level has to be duplicated. Let's have a close look at these three levels. At the physical level, it's about how the data is stored. It's about index structures for efficiently finding data, optimization of disk pages, byte layout, or record order in order to efficiently retrieve data from the storage medium. On top of the physical level, we have the logical level, providing a logical view on the physical level. It hides all the implementation details. It's just about what data is stored in the database and what's the relations among this data. In the relational model that we will be considering in this course, the logical level can be thought of as a set of tables that contain the data stored in the database. On top of the logical level, we have the view level, so we can create different views on the logical level. We can hide certain information, for example, for privacy, security, or we can aggregate information to help application programs. And this structure of the three levels ensures what is called logical and physical data independence. The logical data independence is the ability to change the logical schema without breaking existing applications. The applications access the views and they do not talk to the logical level directly. So for example, we can add additional columns to the tables on the logical level and we can hide these additional columns in the views and the applications can continue working without any change. The physical data independence is the ability to change the physical schema without changing the logical schema. So for example, that you have a database that has a thousand users and suddenly your user base explodes and you have a hundred thousand or a million users. This means that you might have to change the database engine. You might have to change the index structures. Maybe you have to distribute the database over many computers. And you can do all this without changing the logical level and without breaking the views. So you do not break any of the existing applications. You just change how the data is stored physically. In this course, we are working with relational databases. They are based on the relational model. In the relational model, the view and the logical level represent data as relations or tables. We have two example tables on this slide, the customers and the accounts table. You can think of these tables as classes in object-oriented programming. Each row in these tables represents one object that belongs to the particular class. And the columns of these tables represent properties that all of the objects in the class have. So for instance, every customer has an ID, a name, a street, and a city property. Every account has a depositor and an account number. In the pure relational model, these tables are considered as mathematical relations. So they are sets of tuples. For instance, the accounts table 
is a binary relation. It's a set of pairs because it has two columns. The customer table has four columns. So this is a set of four tuples. So for instance, one of the tuples in the set is the tuple 302 Elvis 12 East Amsterdam. There's one important thing to note about representing relations as tables. First of all, the tables allow to have duplicate rows. This is not allowed in the pure relational model because the set cannot have duplicate elements. Second, the tables suggest that there is an order on the rows. This is also not the case in the pure relational model. In a set, you do not have an order on the elements. A database schema describes the structure of a database. It describes what relations, what tables do we have, what columns these tables have, and it describes constraints. In the example schema shown on the slide, we have a customer's table and an accounts table. The customer's table has columns ID, name, street, city. The accounts table has a columns depositor and account number. The ID of the customer's table is underlined, and this is a constraint. It means that the ID should uniquely identify the customer. We cannot have two different customers with the same ID. And likewise, the account number for the accounts table is underlined. Moreover, in the accounts table, we have an arrow from the depositor to the ID of the customers table. What this means is that the depositor references a customer. So whatever depositor number we have, there should be a matching customer in the customers table. A database instance describes the actual content, the state of a database at some particular moment. So you can think of a database schema as just the table headers, just the name of the table and the name of the columns, whereas in database instance are the tables filled with data. So you have rows of data in these tables. One of the important features of databases is that they provide a convenient query language for querying and manipulating the data stored in the database. For relational databases, the main used query language is the structured query language, short SQL or SQL. From the user perspective, we want elegant, easy to use query languages but we also want that the data access is as efficient as possible. To this end, database management systems provide high-level declarative query languages. They are elegant in the sense that we only have to describe what information we want. We do not need to describe how this information is retrieved. So for instance, we do not need to care about any optimizations or index structures and so on. The efficient access is purely the task of the database management system. The database management system takes the high-level declarative query and it decides on itself how to execute this query in the most optimal way. Kowalski described algorithms as a combination of logic and control. In imperative languages, we have explicit control but only implicit logic. We explicitly describe how things are computed, but what is computed is left implicit. In declarative languages, this is reversed. We have an explicit logic. We explicitly describe what we want, but the control flow, how this is computed, is left implicit. Examples of declarative languages are logic programming, like Prolog, functional programming, such as Haskell, or markup languages such as HTML. In relational databases, the main query language is SQL, the structured query language. SQL is a declarative data manipulation language, so the user describes the conditions that the requested data needs to fulfill. Let's have a look at the example query on this slide. Here we define that we want to query data from the customer's table. The WHERE clause specifies conditions for the rows that we want to consider. 
So here we specify that we want to consider only those customers whose name is Elvis and that live in Amsterdam. Finally, the select clause specifies what properties we want to include in the output. So this query tells that we want the IDs of all the customers that are called Elvis and that live in Amsterdam. Such declarative query languages are much more concise than imperative languages, where we also describe how things are computed. And this of course has main advantages, it's less expensive program development, and it's much easier maintenance. The database system will take this declarative query and will decide how to execute this as efficient as possible. Usually, the user does not need to care about efficiency. One of the advantages of database management systems is that they provide well-defined data models and they allow to define integrity constraints that the data has to adhere to. In our case, the data models, of course, are the relational model and we have a query language, SQL, that allows us to manipulate the data, to define the relationships on the data and to define constraints. Let's have a look at that. This is an overview of the kind of integrity constraints that we can define. First, let's have a look at the customer table. Here, we have the ID underlined. This indicates that we have a primary key constraint on ID. The ID should uniquely identify the customer and the database management system will reject any update that leads to two customers having the same ID. In the accounts table, we have a foreign key constraint. The depositor refers to another table, namely the customers table. What the database management system will ensure here is that for every depositor number, we have a matching customer in the customers table whose ID matches the depositor number. Moreover, of course, we can define data types for our attributes. We can say the name should be a string of a certain length. We can define additional constraints. For example, we can express that the value in certain columns should be unique, similar to keys. We can say that the value in columns should never be null. So we can say it's not nullable and so on. Also, we can define what is called check constraints. These are logical expressions to uh, guarantee the domain integrity. For example, we can express that the age of a customer should at least be 18 and at most 150. SQL can be used as a query language, but also as a data definition language. On the slide, you see an SQL statement that creates a table solved with columns ID, name, homework, and points. The statement also specifies the data types for these columns and it specifies additional constraints. Let's have a look. So we specify that there's a column ID that is of type int and that should be automatically incremented. So whenever a new row is inserted in this table, the ID will be incremented. We also specify that the ID should be a primary key for this table. So the ID uniquely identifies the row. Next, we have a column name, which is of type varchar 40. So this is a string of variable lengths of at most 40 characters. And we specify the constraint that this string should not be null. So we have to fill a value. It cannot be empty. Homework is a decimal number of two digits. And also homework cannot be null. We have to fill a value. Points is again a decimal number of two digits. It cannot be null. And we include a check constraint that ensures that the points are at most 10. So we cannot fill any number higher than 10 or the database will reject the update. We can also use SQL to create views. So we could create a view called solved homework on the table solved. So this view 
we, we give the name of the view and then we give an SQL statement that creates the table for this view. How does this work? We say that we want to select the ID, the name and the homework. So we select three columns from the table soft. An important aspect of database management systems is that they allow the concurrent access of many users in parallel. While allowing this parallel access, the system ensures that the transactions are executed with the so-called asset properties. So what's a transaction? A transaction is a sequence of operations that belong together. They perform a single logical function on the database. Think for instance of transferring money from one bank account to another bank account on the same bank. Then all these operations, reading the values, reducing one value on one bank account, increasing the value on another bank account, this belongs together and should be considered as one atomic operation. You do not want this operation to be interrupted in the middle after you have decreased the money on one bank account but have not yet added the money on the other bank account. So these are the so-called asset properties. They stand for atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability. The atomicity guarantees that transactions are executed either fully, they are committed, or they are not executed at all if they are aborted. This is the same with the money transfer from one to the other bank account. You either want it to be executed fully, that the money has been reduced and added to the other bank account, or not at all. Also, any update should leave the database in a consistent state. That's the consistency. The database should reject any update that violates one of the integrity constraints. The database management system also guarantees that the transactions of many users in parallel are executed as if in isolation. So multiple users can modify the database at the same time, but they will not see each other's partial actions. They can operate on it as if they would operate on it alone. And finally, if you have committed changes to the database, then they should be persistent. So they should be durable and the system should be able to recover even if the system crashes, it should recover from failure and restore to the last consistent state. The first subject that we will treat in this course is the design of database schemes. Our main tool for designing databases will be the Entity Relationship Model, short ER model. You see an example on the bottom of the slide. The blue boxes are entity sets and the red diamond is a relationship set. So the blue box customers is an entity set and the elements of this entity set are entities that's the customers. So you can think of the entity sets as classes and the elements, the entities as objects in object oriented programming. So in this entity relationship model, we specify that every customer has a property ID, name, street, and city. And likewise, an account has an account number and the balance. The relationship set depositor links the customers with the accounts. The elements of a relationship set are relationships. An example relationship is for example that the account 217 is held by customer hours. Alternatively, we can use UML class diagrams to design databases. The idea is similar to entity relationship diagrams, just that the entity sets and the relationship sets are now classes and associations. In this course, we will only briefly touch upon UML class diagrams. We will mainly discuss the differences with the entity relationship models. Once we finish the conceptual design, we have our entity relationship model or our UML class diagram. This conceptual design is translated into a model understood by the database management system. And in our case, we will translate it into the relational model. To finish, let's summarize the advantages of database management systems. 
First of all, we've discussed data independence. We've seen the physical level, the logical level, and the view level. So we can change how data is stored on the physical level. We can change the index structures without breaking the logical scheme. And we can change the logical scheme without changing the views, so without breaking existing applications. Having the views on the data stored in the database also helps with the avoidance of duplication, because different users can use different views, so we can hide certain things from certain users if they are not, to, not allowed to see certain information. Also, we can use the views to aggregate information and to make, help making application programs easier. Database management systems provide us with a high-level declarative query language, SQL in our case, and they provide an automatic query optimization that ensures efficient access to the data. Along with the database management system also comes a well-defined data model, in our case the relational model, and we can define data integrity constraints that are guaranteed by the system. An important aspect of database management systems is that they allow the concurrent access of many users. Many users can concurrently access and change the database. And the system guarantees that these changes happen according to the so-called asset properties. So the system upholds the atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Along with many users operating on the database, also comes the right management, so we have security provided by the data management system. Once the changes are committed to the database, the database guarantees that the changes are persistent so that there is a recovery from failure or system crashes. Finally, databases are designed to store large amounts of data, so we have scalability we can store data that is much larger than what fits into the main memory. 